So it's our pleasure, our big pleasure to introduce David Gotches, who one of these numerical wizards who's going to tell you a little bit about process linkages on the WARF uh, Hydro National Water Model. Great. Thanks, Jai. Uh, appreciate the offer to come and talk about uh, the WARF Hydro system and its impl implementation as the National Water Model. Some folks who've been involved in sort of more of the forecasting community as opposed to just sort of the basic process research community may have heard about uh, this national water model. So I'm going to spend a little bit time just basically framing why the national water model was built. It is an operational surface water prediction system that the National Weather Service runs right now and you can get forecast 24-7, 365 with it. Uh, but from a scientific perspective, there's still a lot of holes to poke at, and we're going to poke at a few of those in this talk as a means of sort of stimulating some interaction and, and hopefully some collaboration, uh, because this is a brand new effort that just went into operations last summer. summer. And the idea, did they get that? The idea with it was that um, it's, it's not just sort of a NOAA thing. It is sort of a built on a community modeling uh, set of infrastructure, which is this Warp Hydro system. Warp Hydro has had interactions with CSDMS and the NASA Land Information System and a bunch of other tools as well. Uh, and so really trying to find some pathways to engage the broader community, and CSDMS does a really good job at that. So the motivation for the National Water Models is really NOAA trying to address a host of environmental prediction problems. Uh, you could probably draw up a list of these. Uh, on your own of what are some of the critical needs for water information, operational water information across the country now. What's listed here is sort of a long-term vision of where NOAA wants to move its water forecasting capabilities. So it starts with this basic things that they do a lot of, or even we're doing before the National Water Model came online, sort of flood predictions for the protection of lives and property but they're gonna be moving forward with other partner agencies in doing more environmental predictions. So things like pollution, drought, and long-term water resources, forecasting, and then aspects leading into ecosystem sustainability and biodiversity. And of course, all of these topics cross a number of different spatial scales and temporal scales, uh, and they're multidisciplinary in and of themselves. And where NOAA was in, say, before the National Water Model uh, concept was started to be incubated about three or four years ago, four or five years ago, their, their tools weren't really aimed at providing information like this. They were sort of a, a more traditional set of engineering forecasting tools designed and heavily calibrated to produce a stream flow forecast at a point, but not necessarily a, a more holistic representation of hydrology or of surface water hydrology anyway. And so the water model is an attempt to move in that direction, kind of in, embody more of an earth systems modeling approach. So embedded within that, of course, is these ideas, not sure why that keeps cutting in and out, um, of moving across scale. So the National Weather Service does weather prediction, they do climate prediction, they're constantly moving information across scales, particularly in the atmosphere. They run global numerical weather prediction models. Those go through different sets of either dynamical or statistical downscaling tools to try to provide impacts-based forecasts, which ultimately reach down to the street level. At least that's the vision or that's the intent. And increasingly, instead of doing that with uh, what I would say are some ad hoc methods, they're trying to use more physics-based methods. Sometimes in fully two-way coupled uh, physics-based modeling systems, sometimes in sort of a one-way cascade of models uh, and, and model outputs. But you move down to regional scales, you move down to watershed scales, and ultimately down to street scales. And that's where the water model is going to be trying to head over the next uh, several years of development. So as I mentioned, we went into operations with, uh, with NOAA, with the Weather Service, last August. And these were a number of the different guiding principles or goals of that. It wasn't to tackle the whole, we're going to go do biodiversity prediction in year one. That's sort of the long-term uh, set of goals. These were the kinds of things that they were looking at. So trying to provide operational streamflow guidance in areas that previously had no forecast. So there's about 4,000 or so forecast points around the country that the river forecast centers were making forecasts for. 
largely at or below, say, reservoirs or river locks, um, levee systems, things like that. And now they're trying to move way beyond that to reach up into the entire channel network for the nation. Also trying to provide hydrologic information on a lot of the other surface water states that we encounter, snowpack, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and of course, flood inundation is, is really one of the biggest high impact uh, forecast variables that they were after. Uh, they wanted to seamlessly interface these new water forecast products with what they call uh, geospatial intelligence or basically doing the intersection between water information and critical infrastructure. So bringing things together into sort of a GIS framework for enhanced decision making. Their older models that just gave you a point forecast didn't really allow them to do that. You got the forecast at that point and didn't have a lot of other, a lot of other spatially distributed information. And then finally, that last bullet is moving towards an earth system modeling capability. So this was the goals of version one. Um, the schematics you see here, are just sort of some of the boilerplate uh, resources that are now available. There's a web page that NOAA hosts for the national water model. Um, there's a variety of different outputs that I'm going to highlight in a little bit that come out of the national water model in addition to just stream flow. As I mentioned, we went into operations in August of 2016. And uh, since then, we've done two version upgrades. So we've got three versions of the model which have happened within a year, uh, which is pretty tiring. But um, we're sort of getting over the hump of that. And along with that is a lot of uh, verification work, which I won't have time to go into today. But we're slowly starting to push that verification work out into some online resources and as some webinars that have been uh, put together. So technical specs on the water model itself. It uh, ingests about four and a half terabytes of data a day, which is largely coming from the national radar mosaic and numerical weather prediction models. We output about three terabytes of data a day. We utilize the USGS NHD plus channel hydrography or stream flow network. So it's got a representation of about 2.7 million channel reaches for the nation. And uh, in the first versions, we had about 1,260 reservoir objects that were identified within that, but there is no active management of those. So it's pretty simplistic at this point in time. There's around 360 million computational elements, about 75,000 lines of code. And it uses in operations with the various forecast cycles about 100,000 CPU hours a day. So from a hydrologic prediction perspective, this is a pretty big computational problem, particularly compared to the prior generations of operational forecast systems. But in terms of Earth system models, climate models, weather models, this is not too big. And even that level of a sort of parallelism and CPU usage and, and data throughput is, is not really fully taxing uh, the capabilities that we have. And so if any of you sat in on Reed Maxwell's talk, you'll see, you know, there's another generation of hydrologic models, which are really sort of pushing the envelope in computational hydrology. The modeling workflow looks largely like this. There is in the top left-hand corner there, there's a whole component which stands independent of the physics of the model, which takes and pre-processes meteorological data. We call it a meteorological forcing engine. It does downscaling, it does bias correction and regridding units conversions to get all of the meteorological data onto a common grid and into a common format for ingest into the model. And then the key model components that we'll focus on here are these other ones. And this is where sort of this multi-scale aspect comes in, which is sort of the title of the talk. One is that we drive from that weather information a single column model, basically a, a distributed column of land surface physics, which handles the exchange of energy and moisture to and from the atmosphere. It's a full energy balance model, uh, mass and energy conserving. And that is set up on a one kilometer grid. And so it's just vertical process representation there. That's where the snowpack, the canopy processes, the vertical soil water flow is. And then there's two way coupling of that with overland flow and saturated subsurface flow routing components, which happen on a much finer grid. Now in this particular instance for the water model, that happens on a 250 meter grid. I know many folks in this uh, room uh, would say, wow, that's really coarse, actually. Uh, we're doing the whole country at 250 meters, so it is, it's, uh, it's a big challenge in that sense, but we're still sacrificing a lot of resolution, particularly in some of these very complicated areas um, where inundation dynamics can have a very big impact over very small vertical ranges. So it's just a shortcoming of the current version of the model. There's plans to keep marching down in resolution, but that's where we started with this version. So that two-way coupling exists between the column model and the routing physics. 
And then we actually had a requirement from the weather service, which is to do all of the channel routing on this NHD plus network, the Spectre network exactly. So we have to go from a grid to a, basically a river vector transformation. And so we utilize this set of catchments, which are associated with those river vector network elements to handle basically the remapping of certain hydrologic states and fluxes from the routing components into the channel components. And then once we're in the channels, we can route down the channel network and go through reservoir objects. So there's a couple different spatial transformations here. I'm gonna highlight a little bit more as uh, we move forward. One last thing I'll say about just the sort of the implementation of the water model itself in operations is that there's four different configurations that are sort of cycling all the time. There is an analysis cycle, which is generating a set of initial conditions for every forecast cycle. And that analysis cycle runs from about three hours in the past up to the present and is assimilating in real-time stream flow data from the USGS real-time stream flow network. We drive each of these configurations with a number of different weather models. I'm not gonna have the time to go into those today, but I will say that there is a short range forecast model, which uses sort of the latest, greatest, very high resolution convective weather forecasting model that the weather service runs. That goes out to 18 hours. There's a new forecast out to 18 hours. It's updated every hour. There's a medium range forecast, which cycles only four times a day, and that runs out to 10 days. So that kind of helps us with sort of larger river system forecasting, big flood events, like what just happened in the Midwest uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where we were really looking at the medium range forecast, all the atmospheric river events that happened in California this winter. We looked a lot at these medium range forecasts. In the summertime, we look mostly at those short range forecasts, looking for flash flood events. And then there's also a, a kind of a stripped down and simplified long range configuration where we don't do the high resolution terrain routing. We're more doing sort of a, a, a macro scale um, hydrologic modeling approach here. Uh, and that's a true ensemble model, which has 16 members a day and runs out to 30 days. And that's more for water supply forecast. So here's a closer look at the physics uh, in a sort of a schematic sense. We've got the column land surface model, which is <clears throat> called this NOAA MP, NOAA Multiphysics Land Surface Model, um, that comes from the atmospheric science land surface modeling community. That interfaces with an overland flow, a gridded overland flow methodology, which uses sort of a steepest descent of diffusive wave equations um, associated with it. There's a lateral saturated subsurface uh, flow module that's hooked in on that high resolution grid as well to do um, basically shallow uh, Vados zone saturated transport. This is not a true groundwater model. We don't really have aquifer process representation. It's really just in a, in a soil column in the Vados zone. Because we don't have a groundwater model, we need a conceptualization for base flow processes, sort of the long-term memory processes. So <clears throat> in this current generation, there is a fairly conceptual base flow scheme uh, that is hooked into that. And then those overland flow, laterated, lateral saturated subsurface flow and the space flow scheme provide the inflows into the channel network, which happen on this NHD plus network. And there you can see, this is for the lower Mississippi River Valley in that diagram. You can see the little dots in there, like the orange and the pink dots. Those are the traditional forecast points from the weather service. That's basically the resolution of forecast you would get spatially just at those isolated points. And then the blue line network associated in there is what the new water model's giving you, uh, just in terms of coverage of, of forecast service. And then of course, there's these basic uh, reservoir objects that exist in the model. So focusing in on the spatial transformations, and this is where I think, you know, CSDMS has also had to address a, a set of certain, a certain set of issues or a similar set of issues. Right now in the current generation, we use this straight rectilinear regridding process. So it's pretty rigid and it's pretty, you have to define everything pretty rigidly in advance in order to do this. And it's just basically a straight decomposition of some of the runoff fluxes from this column land surface model to pass them over to, to the routing components. We've been working with the ESMF or system modeling framework folks who've developed a set of generalized or generic regridding tools so that we can move across different spatial elements here. One of the things that many of you folks would know, um, sorry about that, I'm not sure why that's going to but uh, is, you know, we waste sort of a lot of computational time having uh, all these fine grids everywhere and maybe some places that you don't need them. And so moving to some unstructured grid frameworks is something we're working with now to try and gain some computational efficiency, but that requires using a more generalized regridding framework. 
it looks something like this if you map it out. This is uh, essentially the grids overlaying on Springfield, Missouri. Um, and then the blue line network cuts through that so you can see sort of the various resolution of the different grid elements as they map onto this blue line flow network in this area. Now, in the NHD Plus data set, there is a unique catchment that's identified with each one of those blue line elements. And that's how we get the mapping from those grids to each one of those channel elements. And those catchments and those river channel elements, those river reaches, have a common unique identifier associated with them. And that then provides the back, backbone of this information service to which all the stream flow information now starts to be served on. Um, the only other thing that's in there is that we do have these reservoir objects. This is Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, uh, just a snapshot from this morning's set of forecasts. The gridded field you see over line there is the one kilometer analysis from the National Water Model of snow water equivalent that's left in there. And so you can see at this scale, things start to look a little bit crude uh, compared to what they would look like in reality. But you get an idea of what a reservoir object is. You have to sort of topologically link that in with this channel network and then have the ways to map those land surface model states and fluxes uh, into this catchment framework to pass fluxes into the channel network. So th that's the sort of the, the bare essentials of what the, uh, the spatial transformations are. I didn't throw up any equations just because of uh, time, but all of that stuff has to sort of be worked out in advance uh, you know, as inputs into the model to go through this dynamic sort of spatial transformation or regridding process on the fly. So here's a summary then of sort of what's in operation right now. You can see the full model domain exists up there. Uh, we do the land surface model grid and the routing grid over that entire domain. Where you see the sort of rainbow catchments highlighted here is where this NHD plus data set is actually defined. The channel network is defined. And so those are the areas where we're doing stream flow. And those are basically the areas that are tributary to all of the river systems within the US. In the version that will go into operations next year, we've added the Great Lakes Tributary Basin on the Canadian side as well. Uh, so we'll be doing Great Lakes Tributary Flows uh, starting in 2018. Um, some of the other data sets that are used, we use the USGS National Land Cover data set from the 2011 version. The one kilometer Statsco soils data, which I'm sure in this group has, uh, can cause some people some nausea, but it is unified for the CONUS. And that's one of the things that we had to rely on right now, but uh, certainly open to a lot of experimentation improvement associated with soils classifications there. There are a couple of different vegetation data sets that we use, uh, time evolving climatological data sets, and we'll be moving to some more dynamic updating data sets as uh, new versions come online. Most of these other things I've, I've mentioned already uh, in the past. Uh, the only other thing I'll say is that the channel routing as we're doing it right now is fairly simplistic. It is a hydrologic-based methodology, which uses this muskingum conge based methodology, quite old. But for the first implementation of the model, we need something that was fast and stable. And so this was amenable. It had been sort of demonstrated to sort of be very scalable uh, across the country. A couple uh, hundred, where we used about 512 processors in operation for each model job. So computationally, it was efficient to use and, again, very numerically stable. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of room for improvement with more modern hydro hydraulic based methodologies uh, for channel routing. Okay, so what do some of these products look like that come out of the model? Um, this is an animation now of one of our retrospective simulations uh, that was done in preparation for the original version of the model. And you can really start to see a lot of the sort of interesting hydrologic and hydrometeorological behaviors expressing across the country. This is actually from 2015. We're getting into the end of May here. There's a very wet period here in Southeast Texas and in Louisiana. Houston floods happened right over the Memorial Day weekend of uh, that year. So you'll see these very fast moving patterns of rainfall moving across the country. They kind of light up the small river channels as they respond proportionally to the local rains. And then behind those, you see sort of the lagging of these flood waves moving down the bigger river systems. The Colorado River there, you see sort of draining out from the spring snowmelt signal, same with parts of the upper Columbia as well. And so this was one of the first times of sort of seeing this national hydrography in sort of a, a dynamical mode responding to, to real weather events. And you know this is actually what's running in operations now. From any of those reaches across the country, you can go in, you can pull out forecasts uh, at all those different time scales that I mentioned. There's a short range, a medium range, and a long range forecast. 
um, you can start to overlay forecasts together and try and get some probabilistic information on stream flow from these. And there's a lot of work going on now related to validating these flows. You'll see a lot of variance in all of these forecasts. These are coming from weather models, which have a lot of variance in the precipitation drivers uh, in and of themselves. Down in the lower left-hand corner, that's just an example of what's produced from the long-range forecast. So it's more of a water supply forecast. We're not really deterministically saying what's going to happen on day 27 of a forecast. We're saying this type of application is useful when we look at the accumulated flow processes over this large period of time, over like a snowmelt season or potentially over a drought period uh, and looking at what the water resource might be from that. Uh, I'll just show a few more examples here and then, and then start to wrap up. This is just an example of a forecast that was made during this past winter, it's January 3rd through 7th. It was an atmospheric river event in California. So we were looking at this area uh, near Merced, uh, near Fresno, California on the Merced River. And this forecast started to pick up this event about five to six days in advance. You see the red and blue dotted lines on the bottom were about the seven and eight day in advance forecast and they weren't really tagging this event. But then the forecast model sort of came into consensus and everything started grouping around uh, what ultimately became the, the observed flow, which is the solid yellow line in there, uh, within about five to six days in advance of the event. But there's still a lot of uncertainty associated with the peak flow amount that came in with this and the timing. The model does tend to be a little fast in terms of propagating a lot of these events downstream, and that's likely uh, needing some more calibration of the Muskingum Tons method. But this is an example then of the kinds of forecast products which would come out of this. We're starting to track snow melt uh, throughout the Rocky Mountains. This is from about a week ago. This is a medium range forecast. And we start to see things like these concatenated diurnal cycles of snow melt patterns that are occurring. This is the Animus River at Durango. Um, and we have a high bias in this particular case at this particular uh, forecast period. Um, the model uh, in the version that it was running then tended to be a little bit early on its snow melt, which was contributing to this bias. Uh, and so this is something we've been working on and, and tracking moving forward. Um, this is just another case study event for some of this recent Midwest flooding. This is just showing an example nine days before this event here in Northeast Oklahoma. The dotted line is the observed. There was one forecast cycle that was starting to pick up this event. Now I'm just gonna step through and look at a few more. This is three days before the event. We're starting to get good forecast consensus around what ultimately became the observed event, there was one forecast cycle which still didn't validate well. So you get, a, again, a lot of this variance in forecast to forecast. And then the day of the event, there were a number of different events that uh, forecast cycles which didn't produce a ton of rainfall, although some of them did. And again, provided a level of probabilistic guidance at this particular site. So again, you could see there's some dotted lines here. Those are the National Weather Service defined flood stages. Regardless of the forecast cycle that was used here, pretty much all of these ended up being in a major flood category. And of course, this was an area that saw a lot of inundation. Um, there's a number of other products I'm gonna zip through really well, really quickly here to, uh, to wrap up. A lot of folks who run hydrologic and river routing models have their own operations, like your river operations coded in. So they may not be that interested in the river flows that come out of the model, but they might be interested in the channel inflows coming off the landscape how much snow melt driven runoff or other types of runoff are, are being generated uh, as, as different kinds of scenarios that they could use. And so one of the outputs from the water model is basically just what water is flowing into this channel network uh, all along those 2.7 million river reaches. And so this is just a snapshot at one point in time of where water was flowing into the network and some of our pre-operational runs. Another thing that would potentially be interesting to this community, which is, uh, it's, a, it's kind of interesting to look at. We don't have much confidence in it at this point in time. This is an aerial shot of the Grand Canyon. And if you add the channel elements in there, you see some interesting features. Some of those map up really well with the dry riverbeds in that area. And some of them don't map up well at all. They kind of head straight up a canyon wall in certain cases. So that NHG plus data set is, is far from perfect. Um, is one thing that's noticed on this. But the other thing is actually plotted here in terms of color is the river velocity. So as we go through the channel routing calculation, you can back out a velocity uh, term from that. And so we go ahead and serve this. We don't have 
much, if any, faith in this in the absolute sense, but in a relative sense, it's actually kind of interesting to look at in terms of how velocity would change across different stretches of rivers and really as if different events propagate through the system and where river velocities start to pick up very quickly. Um, I'm sure this community can think of a host of applications to things like river velocities and habitat and erosion and even recreational applications. But um, I just wanted to mention that that was one of the interesting outputs from the model and it certainly, um, I don't know, there's gonna be some interesting times looking and validating some of that stuff. A lot of other variables, um, there's precipitation products, there is soil moisture products which are coming out of this, there's sort of this depth to saturation and a ponded water value, how much water is starting to, to pond up on the surface in response to the overland flow calculations as well. These are all snapshots from that Midwestern flooding that happened a few weeks ago with flash flood watches and flash flood warning polygons overlaying on that. So this information is just now starting to make it into the forecast office for this. Are we about done, Jim? One minute? Okay. All right, so snowpack evapotranspiration, that's just another high level map of the shallow water table depth. Um, you can zoom in and look at a, a number of different these. There's one more thing that I wanted to show at the very end, and this is sort of a new capability. And it's where the weather service is looking at sort of an on-demand computing to put in nests at very high resolution for specific events. And it's called this hyper-resolution nest development. And this is just an example of one of those that we set up for Hurricane Matthew of last year. This is the model implemented just over this limited domain at 30 meters, turning the channel routing off and basically resolving uh, the flow processes here as just an overland flow coupled surface uh, and overland, couple surface, subsurface overland flow process uh, for this. And you can see some interesting features in the time evolution of inundation and some of the barriers to flow, like some of the roadways that exist can actually prevent, present barriers in the DVM. So with that, I'm done and I'd be happy to take a question or two. Thanks. Can you just pop back a slide to the R package that you went through? I'm just curious what that was. Okay. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to do that. So one of the things we had to do is there really wasn't, at, when we started this, at least the Weather Service didn't have one, we didn't have one, we didn't know of one at that time. Uh, this was two, three years ago, sort of a, a comprehensive package for doing hydrologic model evaluation. So we built this package, it's called R-Wharf Hydro because it was originally designed to link up with this Wharf Hydro system, but it's actually pretty generic. I mean stream flow time series or stream flow time series and you get some different models uh, and, and put this together. And so right now with the water model, we're doing evaluations with this R package for stream flow, snowpack, soil moisture, ET, um, and inundation as well. And so we're trying to build out this package and there's a lot of other people who are starting to use this for different applications, but it's available online and GitHub and trying like everybody, you know, improve documentation. Is there another question? Is the uh, gridded model input available? The gridded, like the forcing data? Yeah. Yeah, all of the data that goes into and out of the model is available on NSEP, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction, their uh, NOMAD data server. Um, the National Water Model web pages has the HTTP, HTTPS and FTP links to that data. And so all of the forcings and all of the outputs that are coming out of the model are there. The operational outputs are stripped down a bit compared to what the model could output, right? I mean, we don't output every model state, you know, stem temperature and every, you know, every component of it. So it's the main hydrologic variables, but the, you know, eight meteorological forcing terms are there. Are you able to say um, what it would take to put in, let's say, your diffusive uh, wave into a kinematic wave in your hydrological model? Are you missing? Channel dimensions, I mean, what's your holdup? Yeah, into the channel routing scheme, that's a great point. Probably the biggest source of uncertainty we have in terms of going to a more hydraulic-based methodology is bankable depth. And this community does produce estimates of that, so it'd be really interesting to talk to people about coming up with spatially distributed estimates of those that are scalable to the whole country, right? And all the different variety of channel structures that we see. That and roughness is also a good one, you know, channel geometry. Sometimes we can get at in other ways, but yeah, all of those are core parameters that would really help us move beyond this more simplistic method. Mm -hmm.
Right. Yeah, and but slot flies in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Let's give David a Thanks big a thanks. From the World Bank. This is the person with the money. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. Um, so, yeah, my name is Brian Walsh. 